Is there a person in here who has not faced trials and tribulations? Probably not. Look back on what got you through those times. And I think it all comes back to here. Stand firm and recognize that the Lord is coming back. James tells it like it is. And if we're but patient enough to listen to what James is offering, it helps us to do what I think is the overall theme in the book of James, and that is find ways to come closer to God. Let's pray. Father God, great physician, terrific Savior, and God... Above all, you are in control. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to teach this morning. May we all learn together. May we heed the words and hear the wisdom as James reveals it to us through your word. Lord God, we are aware that there are many who are not able to be here, and I just ask that you would bring wellness to those. Thank you for every opportunity that you put in front of us to be all we can be for you. Father, help me this morning as we learn together. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, James has been focusing this entire letter on Christian maturity, both in faithfulness to God and in our conduct toward each other. All the lessons that have been presented by the teachers thus far have focused on the need for us to heed and look out for being mature in our Christ fellowship and following we need to put the word of God into action and James very practically gives us great ideas how to do that he's talked to us about showing generosity he's talked about overcoming prejudice taming our tongues remember that lesson growing in humility and putting our trust where it belongs but you know the bottom line from this old country boy of what it all rolls into? He gives us a pattern for being honest. For being real Christians. It's not just enough to call ourselves Christ followers. We got to be continually and intentionally finding ways to serve. To serve each other to serve and honor God through our faith. Today, we're concluding that study, and we're going into chapter 5 on James. And up front, I want to give you the five takeaways so that when we get to going into the lesson, we don't get too slammed in the closing moments to get these takeaways. You know, in my military days, it was tell them what you want them to know. Tell them what it is you want them to know. And then close it with tell them what you want them to know. So here we go. I want you to know that James admonishes all of us to be patient. He also cautions us and really I call it a command from James chapter 5 and verse 16 it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective let's not forget that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful it is effective Next, we should be praying in all circumstances and at all times in all things. Prayer, again, we're reminded, is powerful. 
We should not ignore the opportunity to pray nor neglect doing it. We pray. And then we often take a, an approach that says, okay, been there, done that. But it also, we need to be going and doing the work of the Lord. I call it, let's share our story of redemption. That's what James did. He shared with us the story. And then over in the book of Romans chapter 12 and 12, it all shows how the Bible is so connected. When it tells us, and this is one of the great takeaways of this week, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. And what better way to be rejoicing is to be with each other. What better way to be patient in tribulation is to look to those that have been in tribulation and look how many have survived tribulation and become stronger after that survival. And once again, the continuity and all the connectivity is continue in prayer. So let's go a little deeper now and look at this be patient I'm going to take us on a verse-by-verse -verse tour through starting with James, the verses number, in chapter 5 is verse 7. And I'm sorry if I'm a little coffee. Uh, literally, Jan, I, I don't know if coffee is coughing, but this weather, and I'm blaming it on Paul Wirt. Y'all remember last week he was with us and he was all congested up. Well, that's, I think it kind of slugged off on me. But I'm still patient because it, it really hit me this week that says, slow down, don't be upset too much at Paul. Uh, learn from what you're teaching the congregation this morning. Bottom line is, in 5-7, James admonishes us to remember, Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the earthly and the late rains. Farmers in the group here, you got it. I grew up on a cotton and corn and watermelon farm, literally. And it would just drive me crazy because we'd have to go out, particularly in a watermelon patch. My dad would never allow any sort of automation to enter the watermelons fields. You literally had to put eight seeds in every heel of watermelons. Think about 20 acres of watermelons, folks. With kids and workers hand planting 40 acres of separate heels of watermelons. I didn't realize it at the time. But my dad, through his example, was teaching me a little patience. And the bottom line I re got reunited with James on is that planning and waiting for crops to grow is a long and agonizing process. Well, planting, sometimes it would rain and we wouldn't stop planting. We would just keep digging those holes and putting those eight seeds in the hill. And you'd be wet. And then it was time for it to grow. And it took weeks for those seed to pop up. And then after about the fourth week after they were up, we'd all have to go back to the hills and pull out three of the eight that would come up. Sometimes when you'd have eight seeds, all of them wouldn't come up. But you had to always leave at least three or four in the hill. I never understood why, but I knew that the watermelons got big when you didn't have so many other seedlings there. 
By the way, did I tell you we always soaked our watermelon seed in buttermilk before you would plant them? What a sour puss that was, huh? But that was my experience to planting. Then, 60 years later, I see how still impatient I am because we're throwing the word out there and we're having Bible studies and we're asking people to come to Christ and to learn more about Christ. And things just don't happen fast enough, do they, Neil? And yet, I got to look back and respond to the fact that James, through his word and many other passages in the Bible, it's not ready, fire, aim here, Shaq. It's be patient time. Keep in mind that James was writing to the churches of his time that were scattered all over the place and all of which were under intense persecution. He knew the temptation to want to give up, forsake the name of Jesus, and leave the church to escape the cruel punishment would be very tempting. And that's why he put this be patient in his admonishments. He's telling us all, this is be patient time so the Lord brings justice. Let's go further and look at this next verse in 8. And it says, You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. You know, this is not hard to understand. This is a call to not be unsure about the hope that we all have in Christ. Things are going to get tough here. We got people who are suffering from cancer. They're undergoing chemo. And they're rejecting the chemo. The body is rejecting the chemo. But yet the folks that we have in this congregation are standing firm. Just like James admonished us in these times. We got to have a certain and unanswering resolve to fix our eyes on Christ. Because the day of the Lord's coming is near. By fixing our resolve on Christ. Hello. There's some things that are going to happen here. Let's lock in to be resolved to stand firm on God's word. Because we'll endure until the day of the Lord comes will be counted as righteous because of Christ. And this is what gives us unwavering hope. The one day Christ the Lord will come and set things all right. Is there a person in here who has not faced trials and tribulations? Probably not. Look back on what got you through those times. And I think it all comes back to here. Stand firm and recognize that the Lord is coming back to bring justice. Amen? And that's what we got to do here. And number nine, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge standing at the door. James is exhorting the church to be willing to look over an offense of one another. How many times have you had some angst about something your friend did? Guilty. Yet when that happens what do you do well, what I hope you don't do is go grumbling to someone else about the angst that you may have with your friend I'm sure you have seen this hey Neil did you know what Ronnie said You know, he doesn't like me, Neil. And Neil will tell you, the first thing he's 
reminded me of. Have you talked to Ronnie about that yet? There's a verse over in Matthew 18 that talks about if someone has wronged you, take it to them first before you go spouting it off to somebody else. Right? Somewhere, all of this comes together. And what we on the shepherding team love to do is just bounce things off each other in terms of, well, how do you feel about this? Our senior minister often listens to a lot of this in terms of, what do you think? How, do, how would you react to this? There are times in this congregation where people just get irritated with each other. And the model that we tried to portray here within our team comes right out of this book. Don't grumble against one another. Talking to the church. Don't grumble. Find a way. Because the body of Christ must remain unified. Amen? In Corinthians 1 and 10, we hear about the understanding that while we all sin, that we await the coming of Christ in which we will be counted as righteous. Therefore, we must not get caught up in judging and grumbling one another's every fault and sin. What I love about members of this church is that when you got a problem with me, I haven't seen one time where you don't come to me. And our other shepherds, if you got a problem with something with them, you come to them. Or something that we're doing here. We in this congregation at North Tampa are one of the most unified bunches of Christ followers I've ever served with in my 75 years. I mean that. Whatever is going on in this congregation, you are reflecting a unified Christ follower family. And that's what we are so excited about as to how God is taking us forward here in a way that we can honor Him better than ever. And when you all reflect on this, it's very, very sensible to know that we are in the Word and we are trying to honor God with our lives. James is imperative. In fact, I, I like to say James is commanding that we not grumble. He's reminding us, hey, the judge is at the door. This was early way of, of saying, hey, look, this earthly discord in perspective of the fact that the church there was not in need to judge one another since God would take care of that. He's reminding this scattered Christians workers hey the judge is standing at the door we should look to our brothers and sisters in faith as people that can encourage us that we can encourage to persevere under suffering james is not saying however that we should accept or tolerate sin as i mentioned i think james is commanding us to stay in the faith walk and not in the gripe mode. Be focused, stay focused, and honor one another by not talking behind each other's back about problems you have. Byron, could you get Dr. Chris here? You know, I think James is, is kind of repeating something his big brother taught um, when, when he says, you know, take the log out of your own eye before you start taking specks out of other people's eyes. And in other places, his older brother, you know, taught that, that be careful that you're judging other people because by that same method, you will be judged. And, and so, you know, it's so easy to look at other people under the microscope and, and to look at yourself with what I 
tend to say is rose-colored glasses. You know, it's uh, spending time worrying about where we're falling short is where we should spend a lot of our time, but, but not where we want to spend much of our time. And somehow human nature says we feel better if we're finding everybody else's faults because uh, somehow it makes ours not seem so bad instead of worrying about our own faults and not so much about everybody else's. Wow. And patience is an attribute of the Father. Uh, Peter said that we uh, that he's not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Whoa! I've heard some postulate that the reason the Lord hasn't come to get uh, yet is because heaven's not full yet. Mm. Everybody get that? Thanks, Jan. I appreciate it. Further, in verses 10 and 11, we're reminded again, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have sent and seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. James is again reminding the church that the people who suffered for the name of the Lord are considered blessed. This is profound in that it fights back against the prevailing thought of the culture of that time, where the culture sees the blessed life as having money, family, and a good job, and long vacations, James says that those who are blessed are those who lived their life, who were patient under suffering, and persevered to the end. Wow. James uses the specific example of Job. You know, Job, the righteous man who loved God, but God allowed Job to lose all he had and become extremely ill. Yet Job did not lose his faith. He continued to seek after the Lord. He was patient in suffering, and though his faith struggled and his pain did not fall away. There are a couple of people right now who are very ill, undergoing as I mentioned, the chemo treatments that the body is rejecting. And in our talks and our prayers with these two families, specifically, the encouragement to all of us has been they are persevering. They are not taking a, hey, blame game look at why is this happening to me? They are reminding all of us that we all go through trials and tribulations. That's such an encouragement. That's a powerful reflection of these families' hearts for the Lord. And I believe that God is in control and whatever the outcome the examples of those two families, to me personally, is going to be something that I'll cherish the rest of my life. Job, the classic example. And I believe that the model that Job had is reflected in the model that these two family members are showing We see from Job's example that not only is this a mark of a true believer, but it brings about a blessing. The highlights from these two verses are the truth that suffering is temporary and one day God will restore all his people. Through all of the struggles that we're having, can we just slow down enough? And I'm talking to me because I don't show patience at all. And yet 
going through this study has helped me reflect on Shackelford, all this stuff is temporary. It's but a vapor. It's a mist. It's gone away soon. Stay the course. You mean, God, I can't be Mr. Fix-It? I want to be Mr. Fix-It. This past week, we visited in Marietta, Georgia, with Cindy's sister, suffering from Alzheimer's on a downhill track accelerated much, much quicker than we want it to be. And I was talking to my brother-in-law, and I said, you know, I really admire the way that you're sticking with the treatment. You're doing what you got to do to help her. What is it that I can do to help you? And he said, help me not be angry because, Shaq, I want to fix it. And I'm angry. I'm angry with God that I can't throw enough money at it to fix it. That hit home, folks. We can't fix it, but God can. Byron Richard wants to make a comment here. A little hard to kind of put into words what I'm thinking about. You know, going through this whole theme, really going back into chapter 4 and the beginning of, of, of chapter 5, he's talking about how the things that are important to us in this life become corrupt. Or our riches, he talks about our riches becoming corrupt. Yeah. He talks about, or, you know, we're talking about we lose our health. People that find that they have terminal cancer or, or other diseases that bring the quality of their life eventually to an end. And he talks about here the, the suffering of the prophets. I, but I think he's saying that don't wait until you lose everything to come to that realization that nothing in this life is of value. He's saying recognize that, that everything is vulnerable, whether you retain your riches or not. Think of, it as, think of them as being corrupt, as being worthless, because the grand prize is what awaits us afterwards. Amen. Why do you wait? Okay. Bottom line, take away. Learn to be patient. Practice patience, Shackelford. Practice patience, church. Let's move into the second powerful pieces of chapter 5. And that is the one where we are talking about prayer being a powerful tool. From 5 and 13 through 15, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. James is bringing us back to this subject of suffering. James began the writing on the subject of suffering and to count it all joy when we fall into various traits. James tells us that the prayer is the answer for suffering. Is there any among the congregation who is suffering? Let the person pray. The suffering that James is referring to is not merely that we're having a bad day at work. The bottom line here is, hey, look, what should we pray for when people are suffering. Any ideas? What should we pray about when people are suffering? Monte, what would you pray about when people are suffering? It seems to me that one prayer would be, Lord, give them the strength they need to deal with what they're dealing with. Strength. Boom. Anybody else? How, yes, Chris, we got strength on the board. 
you know, as a younger person, I, I would consistently pray for what I wanted uh, to happen to other people who were suffering um, and not what was best for them. And, and I think even now, you know, oftentimes as people get older and, and we want to hang on to our loved ones, um, we pray for them to stay around when they're in a, a horrible shape and, and, and have no future. And, you know, Paul talked about, you know, I'd love to go on and move on, but if God has more work for me to do, I, I also are, am ready to stay and do that. Um, but I think way too often we pray for older people uh, what's best for everybody else because we all love them and want them to hang around in spite of so much suffering they're going through. Wow. So, so I guess I would throw out that idea of a pray for what's best for that person, pray for what's best for the bigger picture, not pray for the fact that I just want my myself or my family member just to, to hang around and suffer some more or, or go through difficult times. Like it. Like it a lot. Pray for removal of the trial. Yep. Not necessarily praying that you keep my sister-in-law here during the trial. Richard. You know, when we're suffering or when we have difficulties in our life, you know, sometimes we say, I just need someone to talk to. I don't uh, think we necessarily need to pray for anything. We just need someone to talk to. And who better to talk to than God, of course. Well, there's a thought. Just be a listener. Be talkative. Be an encourager. I kind of like the idea, though, that when you hear that, that there's a prayer of praise that could come with the person going through tribulation. Thank you for sharing. God bless this person for the power to share and to talk and for me to be a listener. One of the things that as a young shepherd 30 years ago, I was taken by one of my fellow shepherds to visit with a person in the hospital. And I was scared to death because I was afraid they would ask me to pray over the person in the hospital. And sure as shooting, they did. And I had not thought of enough about what to say what to ask God for on behalf of this person. And literally what came off my heart was, Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I ask you to make this person well. In Jesus' name, amen. That was from here. And what I didn't realize was later on, on the way home, Carrie Patterson, who was the guy who was mentoring me, he said, I thank you for what you said to God in prayer this morning. And I said, I didn't say anything to help the person in the bed. And he said, don't make that judgment call. It's way above your pay grade to do that. God heard you speak from your heart and so i ask you to do the same thing that's what james is telling us to do and of course you know you can't get through this verse uh, without talking about anointing them with oil and many of you have heard the wd-40 song the quaker state the Exxon Mobil story. But it really did happen to me when, again, another shepherding opportunity uh, was asked to go with one of the older guys to pray over the lady who, who was suffering from arthritis because she had paid attention to the word to ask the elders to come pray over me and anoint me with oil. Well, this guy was a guy named Scott Chambers. And he was 87 years old. And he said, you bring the oil. So I did. After much agony, uh, is it motor oil I'm going to take? 
what am I taking? So I went in Cindy's cabinet and I took some Wesson oil and I put it in a plastic container. And I learned quickly that it's not the oil. It's the power of prayer that you're doing. And yet, as a young shepherd, learning how to do that was the model I think James is telling us here. Call the elders and ask them to pray over you. You got a comment. Miss Patty. Another thing we should pray for when suffering is for patience. Patience? Whoa. Patience for you, the prayer, or the person, person in, in tribulation? Patience for the person in tribulation. Very, very good. Any other comments? Chris, got one? You know, when I have tribulations and, 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 and issues, my knee-jerk human response is not prayer. Um, it's usually something other than prayer. and, and, and Like fix it. Uh, well, fix it is one, and, and, and a, a immediate, somebody pulls right out in front of you unexpectedly. The first thing you don't think about is prayer necessarily. Um, you think uh, about Neil. With uh, <laughs> I did look at Neil, didn't I? Yeah. Um, but, but I look back at, you know, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, and it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Well, so, um, you know, I need to pray for joy when uh, they're suffering um, because uh, most of us don't find joy in suffering. Um, and, and we're in, instructed in this book to find joy when we have suffering and tribulation. Finding joy in tribulation. Whoa, that's a, that's a challenge. Neil, help me here, buddy. <laughs> so there's two things that I pray for when I'm praying for those that are sick. Number one is I pray for God's will in their life. And I think we've got to oh, understand God. that God has purpose in our suffering. Uh, as... Chris just mentioned, you know, count it all joy. There's purpose behind that suffering. The second thing that I pray for is I pray that they will draw closer to God during this time of illness. Because sometimes the illness, the suffering, whatever they're going through is God's way of making them depend on him and not on themselves. Excellent comments. Thank you for teaching us how to pray for those who are suffering. I would like to encourage you not to hesitate. When you visit someone who's ill, ask them, may I pray with you? That was a lesson learned early in my walk was, well, I'm here now. What do I do? And the answer is, take it to God. Ask them, may we pray now? And I haven't been turned down yet. So people are not going to necessarily ask you to pray, but if you're visiting the sick, the encouragement would be, may we pray. Ron, help me. Too quick. <clears throat> Two quick things. One, the anointing of oil requires human touch, I think. Oh. And the idea of holding someone's hand or putting your hand on their shoulder kind of conveys a, a feeling of love that we often uh, overlook. The other thing I wanted to mention is that if we were living during the time that James wrote this particular book, we could understand what human suffering was all about and how hard it was to be a Christian when all this revolt and rebellion and constant uh, killing of Christians because they thought they were Jews by the Romans. And, and it eventually ended up with uh, n no capital city, so to speak. <laughs> well, thank you. <clears throat> I don't want to be remiss in sharing a verse with you and when we're talking about the prayer uh, it's in Philippians, the, the book is four and the verses are six and seven. Uh, 
where God promises His peace to those who continually pray. And basically, when we, particularly when I sign a Bible for a graduating senior, I always put this verse in the notation that I sign. Because, carry this as a young graduate or an old person like I am, carry these words. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, tell your request to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Instead of being anxious, we in every situation should pray and give thanks and make our request known to God. If we don't ask God, although He knows everything, we should ask God for things. I plead with God a lot of times. I praise God in prayer a lot of times. But this verse from Philippians is a driver in everything, and I encourage it to be a driver for you in everything. Take advantage of the fact that God will hear your prayers. Continuing on, let's not forget That James also says when a person is in good spirits, we can and should pray. What? Yep. Praise is a form of prayer where we thank God for His goodness, His characteristics, and in context, even thanking Him for the joy He's given us. Well, guess what? You said praise when we're happy? I don't know how to do that. So I put this question up here. How can we practice singing to God when we're happy? What are some helpful hints? Anybody got any ideas? I do. Here's one. Use a hymn book. Oh, I don't have a hymn book. We got it all on the screens now. We'll buy one if you want to. Or borrow one from the church if you want to. See Sandy. If you want to sing some songs. But here's where we are in the real world. Take a look. Go to the web page that we have. We spent a lot of time and effort. Jason Grantham every week posts songs for the next Sunday's service. You can load that on your phone. You can pray, play that app with the songs. You can sing along. Very practical ways. And I had to update my notes because in my old days, it would say, put the cassette tape in your radio player as you're going down the road. Boy, have those days changed. And then there was a CD player. Okay? Now we're on a iPhone and all that Android stuff. But take advantage of it. It's there. And also in our local area, if you're in Florida, Georgia, or Alabama, you can pick up Joy FM and play and sing along with the songs there. Now here's one that I had to kind of scratch up because I don't do this. Memorize a song that encourages you. But always remember that praise music is a way to express the thanksgiving in our heart for God. Praise is fitting, hello, in good times and bad times. Amen? All right, we're coming down to the end. Bottom line, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful. <coughs> And effective. How do you make prayer a daily habit? Part of our DNA. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Guess what? I believe that the day begins with a prayer and ends with a prayer. Do you? In Washington for many years, 
I would pray going down the road driving, talking out loud driving to work. Then I got to be a metro man and I rode the Virginia Railway Express car and I would pray in the express car. It became a habit to begin the day and end the day with prayer. And I can't tell you the blessings that have come from that becoming part of my DNA. Please find a way to pray every day. James did. James exhorts all of us to remember the power of prayer from a righteous person is powerful and effective. As we close, I would like us all to pray this prayer together that's on your handout sheet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we desire to maintain sweet fellowship with you and to walk godly in Christ Jesus. Help us to recognize our faults and quickly seek your forgiveness. Help us to confess our faults to those we have done wrong to. We pray that we may maintain an attitude of prayer and learn to pray fervently in spirit and in truth so that in Christ our prayers may be effective and give you the honor and glory. This prayer I ask in the name of Jesus Christ and the whole class said, Amen.